everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Hannah Witten, and here we like to get real nerdy about all things sex and relationships. And today's video is just a proper, good old fashioned sex education video all about STIs. STI stands for sexually transmitted infection and it is one area of sex education that you may have actually had in school, but as we will get into, it is often an area of shame rather than education that helps people make informed choices about sex and their bodies. And even with the information you do get, there is often a lot of myths, misconceptions and fear around STIs. The reality is STIs are really common and nothing to be ashamed of. This fear and stigma around STIs is actually really harmful because lots of people with STIs struggle with shame and poor mental health. And the stigma can deter people from talking about their status, which means a higher risk of transmission. If you want to learn more about where the stigma comes from, definitely check out a recent episode we did of my podcast with sex and culture critic Ella Dawson, where we talked all about STIs and herpes. The stigma and myths around STIs hurt us all I wanted to bust some myths about STIs and share some facts with you to help combat the shame. Also, I do want to acknowledge that this video is going to be very UK and US focused, so please do share in the comments about how your country or where you're from talks about and tests for STIs. Right, let's dive in and bust some myths. Myth number one, STIs are incurable and getting one will ruin your life. <laughs> There are more than 30 different bacteria, viruses, and parasites known to be transmitted through sexual contact. Of the eight most common STIs, four of them are curable. These are syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomoniasis, all of which are curable with antibiotics. The other four, hepatitis B, herpes or HSV, HIV and human papillomavirus or HPV are all incurable viral infections. But even if you do have an incurable STI, this doesn't mean that your life is ruined or that it will change in any significant way. Incurable STIs aren't terminal. They generally have very minor effects and with all of the treatments and ways to treat STIs nowadays, often the stigma can impact someone's life more than the STI itself. There are actually loads of viruses that are incurable and never leave your body once you've had it, like chicken and pox, which almost all of us have had. And with an STI like herpes, whilst it's always in your body, most people don't experience symptoms after the first few outbreaks. The reality is that getting an STI isn't the end of the world. Even if you have an incurable STI, there are ways to treat and manage the virus and precautions and medications that you can take to prevent its transmission to partners. Also, effective HIV treatment reduces the amount of HIV in your bodily fluids, which is called your viral load. Once your viral load has reached an undetectable level, you can not pass HIV on during sex. There's also PrEP, which is a medication that is highly effective at protecting you against contracting HIV. You might take it if your partner is HIV positive or if you're having frequent casual sex in situations that might put you at higher risk. And breakthroughs in STI treatments are happening all of the time. In February 2022, scientists from the University of California released research about the first woman and third person to have been cured from HIV using stem cell transplants. This is super exciting, even though we are a long way off from a viable cure. Whether incurable or not, STIs are definitely not the end of your sex life. And many people say their sex life actually improved after an STI diagnosis because it forces you to have conversations about safer sex practices and your needs and wants. And if somebody does judge you for having an STI, they're probably not someone that you want to be dating or having sex with anyway. Myth number two, people like me don't get STIs. <laughs> All kinds of people get STIs and statistically, you're more likely to have one than not. According to WHO, the World Health Organization, 3.7 billion people under the age of 50 or 67% of the population have HSV-1. That's two thirds of the world who are herpes positive. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that one in two sexually active people will contract an STI by the age of 25. STIs are not only normal, but common and they have been around forever. There's a lot of stigma about the kind of person who gets STIs, but people with STIs aren't dirty or people who sleep around, they are just 
people. It's important to be aware of risks and take precautions when it comes to your sexual health. But STIs are potentially unavoidable and a totally normal part of being sexually active. And definitely not something to be ashamed of. It's common for people who have just been diagnosed with an STI to experience depression, hopelessness and low self-esteem due to the stigma. It's so important we talk about STIs and our status to combat the shame because there is nothing wrong with you if you have an STI. There are also stereotypes about who can get certain STIs, like the idea that HIV only affects gay and bi men and black people. In reality, data from 2017 shows that women make up one third of people living with HIV in the UK. And HIV now infects more heterosexual people than gay or bi men. We need a new strategy. STIs and the stigma around them affects everyone. Myth three, STIs are a consequence of unsafe sex. <laughs> You can still get an STI if you use a condom. While condoms do provide protection against most STIs, some infections like herpes are passed through skin to skin contact. Because barrier methods like condoms or dental dams don't cover the entire genital region, there is still a possibility of transmission. And you know, condoms can also split things happen. Just don't double layer your condoms and don't use oil-based lube on your condoms because that will definitely increase the risk of splitting. This is one of the reasons why we talk about safer sex and safer sex practices rather than safe sex. No sex is entirely safe. The important thing is to take steps to minimize risks. Plus, the word consequence sounds like you did something wrong. There's nothing wrong with having consensual sex. And STI shouldn't be framed as a punishment for consensual sexual behavior and choices. Myth four, people who have more partners are more likely to get an STI. <laughs> You'd think that people with one sexual partner are less likely to get an STI than people with multiple partners, right? This myth is very much rooted in slut shaming and the shaming of people who have casual sex or sex outside of a long-term monogamous relationship. We're back to those super fun sex negative ideas that people, especially women and people of marginalized genders who have lots of sexual partners are dirty or easy, which is just complete nonsense and bullshit. Research has shown that people in monogamous relationships actually have exactly the same risk of STIs as people in consensually non-monogamous relationships. The study showed that people who practice consensual non-monogamy had more partners but were more likely to use condoms during sex and to get STI tests. Meanwhile, the reality is that some people in monogamous relationships cheat on their partners. And in that case, there is no communication with the partner who's being cheated on about STI risk. And the people cheating were actually less likely to practice safer sex. And of course, people in monogamous relationships relationships can get STIs when somebody hasn't cheated. Perhaps their partner was asymptomatic or someone didn't know that they had an STI because it was dormant and they passed it on. So even if you're in a relationship, it's still important to get STI tests and to communicate openly about your status with your partner before having sex and before you change the contraception you're using. Myth five, you can tell when someone has an STI. <laughs> You cannot tell when someone has an STI. While you may have visible symptoms with an STI, it's also entirely possible to have an STI and be asymptomatic. Symptoms also might be very mild and resemble things like cuts, ingrown hairs, or yeast infections. And some people may not know or be able to identify symptoms of STIs because we're not encouraged to explore our bodies and learn what's normal for us or to pay attention to changes. Part of the reason we might expect STIs to have really visible and obvious symptoms is the way that sex education is taught in schools. This often includes showing young people graphic photos of genitals. This is something that I experienced when I was in year nine, so about 14 years old. We were shown a wonderful PowerPoint presentation with pictures of genitals that had untreated STIs. This was very much used to scare us into using condoms with a gross shock factor, but it was also incredibly stigmatizing and fear-mongery. Sex educator Justin Hancock has actually written a really great blog post about why this is a bad and counterproductive teaching method, which I will link in the description. He lays out research that demonstrates that showing young people these pictures isn't actually effective in preventing STIs. In fact, lots of research shows that these scare tactics are actually very ineffective, and that messaging which promotes the benefits of condom use rather than highlighting the downsides of non-condom use actually is more successful in the short and the long term. Sexual health education which seeks to disgust and dismay is going to create more stigma around STIs, which studies have 
have shown delays young people's attendance at STI clinics even when they think they have STI symptoms. The photos shown during sex education are also inaccurate. They're unrepresentative of the majority of people's experiences. We don't show young people what symptoms they should be checking for might look and feel like. We're showing them extreme and graphic photos which isn't practical and is only going to create more shame and stigma. Myth 6. You can only get STIs through penetrative sex. <laughs> STIs are, by definition, transmitted through sex, but that doesn't have to be just penetrative sex. You can get STIs through penis in vagina or PIV sex, but also anal sex, oral sex, skin-to-skin -skin contact, and sharing sex toys. This myth definitely perpetuates the idea that PIV sex is the only real sex, and so it's the only type of sex that you need to worry about when it comes to STI transmission, which is not true. While there is a very low risk of transmission from unprotected oral sex, there is still a risk. For example, if your partner goes down on you when they have a cold sore. Lack of awareness that you can get an STI through oral sex means that people are less likely to use safer sex practices, which can potentially lead to higher rates of transmission. When you go for an STI test, you'll be advised what kinds of tests you need based on the kind of sex that you have and your risk level. STI tests can include urine tests, cheek swabs, blood tests, a physical exam where a nurse or doctor looks at your genitals, or a vagina, urethra, cervix, anus, or throat swab, which is used to gently take discharge or cell samples. A sample of fluid might also need to be taken from any blisters or sores you have. While you might assume that you just need to give a urine sample or a vaginal swab, if you're having oral or anal sex, it's also really important to make sure you're doing oral and rectal swabs as well. Myth 7. STI screening panels include all STIs. <laughs> STI testing is a huge part of managing your sexual health, and it's recommended that you get tested at least once a year or before each new sexual partner. However, a standard STI panel in the UK or the US usually just includes chlamydia or gonorrhea, and if you have a blood test, syphilis and HIV. So if you ask to get tested for everything, you might not get tested for, well, everything. Herpes and HPV are notably excluded, and you often won't be offered a test for herpes unless you're showing potential symptoms. The theory behind this is that because of the stigma of having herpes, people are better off not knowing their positive status unless they have symptoms to manage. If the virus is dormant in your body, the anxiety of knowing you have it is considered a greater risk than the virus itself. This means that a lot of people don't actually know their herpes status, which tells you a lot about how the stigma around around herpes and other STIs is based on sexual shame rather than actual medical risk. Myth 8. STI tests are painful. <laughs> STI testing is quick and easy and usually doesn't hurt. They might be a bit uncomfortable or embarrassing, but they shouldn't be painful. If you have something like vaginismus where doing a vaginal swab may hurt or be difficult to do yourself, you can talk to the healthcare professional and maybe ask them if they could do it for you. In addition to the stigma around having an STI, the fear of embarrassment or pain or of someone having a poke around your genitals can actually stop people from going for regular STI tests. While urethral swabs might be necessary for people with penis they're taken with a small cotton swab, which might be uncomfortable for a few seconds, but not painful. And lots of parts of the UK offer at-home test kits, which can feel less embarrassing than attending an in-person clinic, so definitely worth checking out if you're feeling a bit nervous. The fear of going to get tested definitely feels like a hangover of sex-negative and abstinence-only sex education, where scaring people out of having sex is the desired outcome, as opposed to encouraging people to make informed decisions about their sexual health. Obviously, these aren't all of the myths about STIs. They're everywhere and pervasive. There is so much misinformation and fear flying around because everyone is scared and no one is checking that the information they're sharing is accurate. When it comes to your sexual health, it's really important to get your information from a source you can trust. Googling an STI might not be the best idea because it can bring up sensationalist shaming websites and articles from unreliable sources. I'm going to leave some links in the description to some verified and fact-based resources so you can check those out if you want any more information. I've also invited sexual and reproductive health doctor, Dr. Annabelle Shoumimo, onto the channel to answer some questions about STIs. Annabelle is also the founder of Decolonizing Contraception, which is a black and people of color led collective that is striving for reproductive justice. And I've spoken to Annabelle about it all on my podcast, Doing It Before. So welcome, Annabelle. Hiya, I'm Dr. Annabelle Shoumimo. I'm community sexual and reproductive health doctor and founder of Decolonizing Contraception. And I'm gonna be talking about some STI myth busting 
and stigma in sexual health. Why do you think there is so much stigma around STIs? There is still a lot of stigma surrounding sexual health and testing for STIs. And I really think that's just got to do with a historical thing about talking about your genitals, people assuming that if you talk about sexual health, that you're promiscuous and that's still having really negative connotations. Even though we're seeing more and more younger generations embracing sexual pleasure, understanding that can be a really key part of having a healthy and fulfilling life. How does STI stigma show up in your work? It shows up in a number of ways. Firstly, it stops people coming to the clinic in the first place people can be really embarrassed to come into the sexual health clinic and get themselves tested that's why now in most areas there is a postal sexual um, health testing service that has been beneficial for some groups that feel that they can't come into the service or somebody will see them or they can't have it posted to their house. Do you have any advice for people who have recently received a positive diagnosis? So firstly, the thing is not to panic. And I also don't advise just going on a huge Google deep dive. There are some really great websites that have reputable information about different sexually transmitted infections, including SexWise website. And that's got um, reliable information. The British Association of Sexual Health and HIV also have patient information leaflets on their website which are really really good and part of our job is to just have detailed conversations when we diagnose somebody as positive whether that's for gonorrhea chlamydia herpes hiv or anything else we should be explaining in detail what that means what treatment is available what services there are to support you the thing that I get quite often is people are quite upset. They think because they've contracted a sexually transmitted infection that they're in some ways dirty or unclean or people will perceive it that way. Anybody can get a sexually transmitted infection, even if you use condoms because they don't stop the transmission of all sexually transmitted infections, particularly things like herpes and warts. So it can happen to absolutely everybody and we all need to work together to destigmatize sexual health and sexual infections. Can you give some reassurance and advice for someone coming in for an STI? I test for the first time. Number one thing, please don't worry and don't think you're going to be judged. We've heard it absolutely all before. If you're concerned, I said about privacy and things like that, there are postal kits, but you can also call clinics and ask about trying to do things at quieter times. If you're worried about being seen and we can make provisions for that, safeguarding is extremely important to us. Thanks so much, Dr. Annabelle Shomimo. I'll leave links to her social media and to decolonizing contraception in the description. So that is some myth busting and shame busting info on STIs. You can go in person to a sexual health clinic for a test and also during the pandemic a lot of places have been offering at home test kits. You could book one together with your partner or a friend and make it a really fun outing or activity. It's really important to tackle the stigma around STIs by getting tested and talking about your status. And remember there is no shame in having an STI. They are a normal part of being sexually active. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and a special thanks to my patrons who support me and help me make this sex education content. I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!